them who just had a major, um, could in, in many ways be considered a life-altering event happen in their life. And it was one of those sorts of things that just would totally deflate some people, you know, the, that, that some people would just get stuck on, on how terrible this was, and I'm purposely not saying what it was, but some people would get so stuck on, on how terrible it was that they wouldn't be able to function, they wouldn't be able to get, to get over it. But, but this man who I was talking to, in the midst of this major kind of life-changing event, he told me how blessed he was. I'm talking to him, and he's talking about, we had just got done talking about, about what he was going through, and he started to give me reasons that he was blessed. And he wasn't just saying, I'm blessed, because, you know, as Christians, we know we're supposed to say that we're blessed. He began listing reasons why he was blessed. He's in the middle of what most people would see as a crisis, as this catastrophic event, um, a problem that would consume most people, and he's listing off blessings that God has given him through the crisis. And that's not, um, just throw this in there now, that's, that's um, always the case, that there are blessings through the crisis, through the, the valley, through the trials. When going through something difficult, there are, are always blessings going on. We're just so often focused on the problem that we miss the blessings that are coming. Um, my brother, uh, Bo, and I have been talking um, kind of about this subject a lot lately because of all the things going on uh, with the church up in Anacortes, with the, the oil leak and dealing with all that. It would be really easy to get fixated on that. It get really easy to see nothing more than, than the problems that that, is br that, that has, has brought up as they're going through it. But as, as Bo and I talked about it and, and kind of have been ongoing talking about it, there have been, through the problems, there have been blessings the entire way. Um, one of the things that he and I were talking about, paying for all of the work that they've done, the amounts of money going out, has been huge, and it's a, a small church. And he told me the last, time I, the last time we talked, he goes, I don't know how, but we're not in the red. All this money's going out. I don't know how, but, but we're, we're not in the red. God just keeps providing. And along with that, um, he's telling me that they've consistently had, had people visiting and, and joining the church and those sorts of things. If we, can, if we can look past the problems, there's always a blessing. And it was while I was uh, talking to, to these guys that um, that day I read this passage in, in my devotions. Verse, uh, Psalm 40, verse 5. Many, O Lord, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and thy thoughts which are to us where they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. You think of, of David, the one who wrote this. David... Um, had some hard times in his life. And you start thinking about it, you know, in my mind, it kind of starts with when the prophet came to find the new king, and David's dad didn't even think it was worth calling him for the prophet to see. You know, that's kind of the start of things not really looking in your favor. Um, you know, you have times of him uh, running for his life from King Saul over and over and over. The, the times of, of sin and the mess that that caused. The times of, of problems with his, with his sons. Later in, in this chapter, in chapter 40, uh, he talks about the evils that have, uh, that have compassed him. He has had problems, but despite the valleys, despite the problems and the trials, he says, many are thy wondrous works. Many are thy wondrous works. What, what I see in the passage is that, that though, um, I'll, I'll word it this way, the, the wondrous works that he lists are not the typical um, blessings that we think of. Because I think we don't think of blessings right quite often. Most Christians see blessings as uh, physical, tangible things. 
You know, they think that blessings of God means that they get a raise at work. And we get the mindset that if someone else is, uh, someone else in church is more financially prosperous than I am, then God is blessing them more than he's blessing me. Uh, when we were in Astoria, there was a family there. Um, his, the guy's kids and, and my brother and I were friends, and so we spent quite a bit of time with them. Um, as a kid, I didn't realize any of this. Now, talking with my dad, kind of hear, hear some of it that that he had had a logging business and and made a lot of money and again as a kid I didn't didn't realize any of this but um, people would complain to my dad about why is he more blessed meaning why does he make more money than me and what they didn't understand was that he had all sorts of health problems and made a lot of money um, because he expected that he would die young and wanted his family cared for but all they saw was he makes more money why is he more blessed than I am all anyone else saw is why, why does God like him more than me? Or, or people think of, of blessings of God being, you know, life going smoothly. Um, for God uh, to be blessing me, it means I can't be facing any problems. That God's only blessing me when, when everything in life is going my way and I have what I want, which is why as soon as problems come or, or a bump in the road, the automatic reaction is something along the lines of, God, why are you allowing this? Meaning, why have you stopped blessing me? Problem is, um, we're looking at the blessings of God wrong. God blessing me doesn't mean that I'm going to have, have more money than I know what to do with. And God blessing me doesn't mean that, that I won't face problems. Those are both kind of popular ideas of the day. But the problem with them is they're both, simply put, they're unbiblical. You try and find, try and find in your Bible where God says, if you'll obey me, I'll bless you and you'll have no financial hardships and there will never be a problem in your life. You try and find the passage that says that. I don't see it in my Bible. In fact, you see those who are serving God and you kind of see the opposite. Those serving God um, don't have a whole lot here because their treasures aren't laid up here. I'm not sure where those preachers who, who claim if you, if you serve God, He'll give you money and make your life easy. I'm not sure where they, they get that from, but they don't get it from their Bible. In this passage... David lists three things that, that God had done for him that he kind of puts under this heading of wonderful works. And all three of them are things that, that are true in the life of every Christian as well. And if we can learn to focus on them, even in times of, of tribulation, in times of, of the valley, then we can say, many are thy wonderful works. Number one, David says, he inclined unto me. Yeah, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, let's, you know, break this down. Think about this for just a minute. Think of, of who God is. The one who was before the world began. There was nothing. When there was nothing, there was God. This is the one who, who spoke the worlds into existence. I um, have, have done a whole lot of construction. I know how hard it can be to build something. You know, the amount of, of time that it requires to build something, like a, a house, for instance, a building, all the, all the, the workers involved, the heavy lifting, the, the hard work and sweat involved in, in the entire process of it, but not for God. He didn't even have to bend down. He just spoke and there it was. And we aren't talking about just a house, a building, but everything. Um, you guys know I like hiking and hunting and all that sort of thing. And often I will think about that if I am out in the middle of nowhere. You know, you look and you see the mountains and the trees and all that. You think, all he did was spoke. And this is here. It's amazing. This is the one who, who judged the world with a flood that covered the entire earth, destroyed everything at one time except for those who he wanted to protect and was powerful enough to protect them through the flood that destroyed everything else. This is the one who, who speaks and the winds and waves obey him. I've spent enough time on the water. No, that doesn't work for just anybody. <laughs> but when God says, peace be still, the waves and the wind are gone. This is the one who, who is able to, to bear the sins of the entire world, past, present, and future, on his back when going to the cross. That's no small task. And as if that wasn't enough, then rose again from the grave to conquer death. I mean, this is, this is God. Think about who he is. 
And then, think about who you are. This is going to sound mean. Um, I'm going to warn you. Don't take it that way. Um, for just a minute here, I'm going to, I'm going to do a, a giant preacher no-no here. For just a minute, we're going to set God out of the picture. I, just follow me here. You'll see why. You think for a moment who you are, not even comparing yourself to God. Think for a moment who you are. Some, of, some, some people in here, I don't know, maybe you've done some pretty, uh, some pretty impressive things, you know, significant achie achievements. But you start comparing yourself to the 7.4 billion people that live in this world today, and you're pretty insignificant. I mean, you aren't the leader of some, some world power. None of us in here, you know, have, have invented something that's changed life as we know it. And um, even if you had, you know, new things are invented all the time. It's not going to be long before what you invented is outdated. We are, are pretty insignificant, and that's just comparing yourself to the other men. So then you start talking who God is and comparing that to who you are, and suddenly... In my mind, at least, it makes it amazing that God would even give me the time of day. That, that someone so amazing as God would stoop himself to notice someone like me. But it's really even more than that because he doesn't say that God notices you. You know, he's walking by and happens to make eye contact. You know, that, that sort of thing happens that, you know, someone famous notices a person in a crowd of nobodies. This is more than that. It doesn't even say that he... He hears us. Um, I have three kids. I hear noise all the time. Don't judge me as a bad parent, but be, just because I hear noise coming from one of my three kids, that doesn't always mean I'm listening to it. I tell the teens um, all the time that there's a big difference between hearing and listening. We all hear sounds all day long. Sound comes into our ears all of the time, but unless we're listening, that noise doesn't do anything. It's not as if this is saying, you know, God hears that I am making some sort of noise. You know, I'm, I'm crying out to God and he hears, I, I think I hear something down there. Right? There's some sort of noise in the background. No, what it says is he inclines. Yes, man. I tell you what that means. It means he wants to hear me. Man. It means he's, he's listening to try and hear me. It means he's focusing in on me to hear my cry. And no matter, no matter what is going on, no matter what I am facing, I can cling to that wonderful work that when I cry to God, the God of all creation not just hears me, He inclines to me. Yes. Second thing I see in this passage, He says that He brought me out, I'm going to word it this way, brought me out of the mire and set me on the rock. Look at, at verse 2, it says, He brought me up also out of, the, out of an horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my going. Again, this is, is referring to, excuse me, to the Christian, the fact that he brought you out of, of sin and set your life on, on the rock, on Christ, is a wonderful work. Think about this, the, how he puts this, you, he, that he brought me out. Um, I love how he describes what God brought him out of. He uses two ways, a horrible pit. Um, that's exactly what our sin is. It's a pit that, that, just, um, that we just keep digging deeper and deeper in. The more that we try to get ourselves out, the more that we try to, to figure out how to, escape, um, how to escape our sin, we just keep getting ourselves in more of it. I don't know. Maybe you've never fallen in a hole or anything like that. I, we grew up in the country. I fell in holes. Um, I had a big brother. My parents always wondered how he came back clean and I came back muddy. And it was because my big brother always would walk along and say, Caleb, you walk there. And then I would walk there and find a hole or find a bunch of mud or find something because I was walking where Bo told me to. So I fell in some holes. When you try and get out of a hole, there's no way to get out without getting everything that makes the hole all over you. As you're climbing up the thing and you're rolling around in whatever mud it is that's making the hole, you wind up just making more of a mess of things and you cover yourself in the horrible pit. It's how it is with sin. The more that we try to climb our way out, the more we, we struggle to get to the top, the more we just cover ourselves in the filth that makes up the pit. That's how he describes it. He took me out of the horrible pit. Then he describes it as, as miry clay. Um, I don't know how much you have experience with clay. I have some. Two memories that stick 
in my mind when it comes to clay. I'm sure my mom can think of one of them. The other, the, the first one, we'll see. The first one that comes to my mind is um, as a kid in Astoria. We lived, like I said, in, in the country beside a farm. And on that farm was a hill, one side of which we referred to as the clay cliff. Because that's exactly what it was. It was about, I don't know. I don't know. As a kid, I thought it was a huge. As an adult, I'd probably go there and it's 10 feet tall. But as a kid, it seemed, it seemed huge, fairly steep, and made entirely of clay. And my, my brother and, and our friend Alex and myself, we would go to the clay cliff as often as my parents would let us, and we would attempt to climb this cliff. One time we actually made it and tied a rope to one of the trees at the top so we could climb easier and the first one up got up there and pulled the rope up so no one else could climb up the, up the cliff. For a kid, it was great. There was only one problem with the clay cliff and that was it was made of clay. And after a day of playing on and trying to climb a rain-covered clay cliff, it was glued to you. You brought half the cliff home with you. Felt impossible to get the stuff off. It, it weighed you down, which made climbing it even, even more difficult, let alone explaining to your mom the mess that your clothes are. It was miry clay. The other memory that I have is um, when we lived in, in Oklahoma where everything is red clay, which very often led to the same result as the clay cliff. Bo and I would play and would come back completely covered in red clay that would never wash out of your clothes again. It was... It was miry. Um, and that's how David's describing his sin that God pulled him from. It's like a pit. It's like this, this miry clay that sticks to you and weighs you down and you can't get it off. And God picked me up out of it. But he didn't stop there. He says he set me on the rock. God didn't lift him up, shake him off a little bit, you know, shake a little bit of the dirt off and say, all right, and set him right back down in the pit again. He established him on the rock. He established him on his, on his son. Again, um, <clears throat> in construction, I've, I've worked on some jobs that were, were old houses that are built on... I don't, I'm not sure what anyone was ever thinking when they did this, but you'll every now and then find an old house that, no joke, their foundation is a stump. And they just build the house on a stump, which is all fine and dandy until the stump rots away, which it's already dead when you put it on, the house on there. But, so I've worked on a couple jobs where they have lifted the house so that they can fix that. They can, they can get the rotten stump out, but they don't just lift it up, rip the rotten stump out, and then drop it back down in the same hole it was before. No, they, they set a brand new foundation. That's what David is saying here. That's what's happened when, when you've accepted Christ. He took you out of the mess of sin that you were in and then set you on, on a new foundation. Personally, I can't find a better way to define that than by calling it a wonderful work. This is something that, that no matter what is going on, we can look at and see how, how blessed we are. Because he took me out of that pit and set me on the rock. Third thing I see in this passage is, he says, He's given me a song. Look at, at verse 3. He hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear, and shall trust in the Lord. And look at this song for a minute because he, he tells us a few things about it. Um, the first thing, and he doesn't, uh, this one is me taking a little liberty, so give me a little liberty here. It's a happy song. It's a song that, that, that brings joy. He says, a song of, of praise unto our God. Praise can't be woe is me. If it is a song of praise, it can't be a song of the blues at the same time. Don't listen to blues music, but I imagine that you will never hear, I got the blues, my God is so great. I mean, you know, that's, it's just, that doesn't, that doesn't work. Praise can't be a, a down in the dump sort of thing. This, this song that he gives is, um, is a song of joy, even when, in an unhappy time. He gives us joy. It also says that, that um, about this song that people are going to see it. I can see someone saying, well, you know, that isn't going to make me real happy in a hard time. I don't want, 
I, I, it won't make me feel blessed if people are going to, going to see, but here's the reason that they'll see. Because it changes you. I already mentioned, you're, you're not in that pit. You're no longer wallowing in the mire. Um, it, it's changed your life. And that them seeing the change in you, the verse tells us, will cause them to trust too. End of verse 3. Um, Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord because of your song. Because of the song that he gave you. Now here's what we have what we have going on. David is, is listing these, uh, these right here. These are, are, are the type of things that, that are God's wonderful works that he's done in David, but that he's done in us. These are things that, that no matter what's happening in, no matter what's happening in our lives, the Christian can look back at and see the blessings of God. But I think the best part, at least in, in my mind, the best part of the message is this, that this isn't an exhaustive list. <clears throat> that it doesn't end with just these three. Look at, at verse 5 again. Many, O Lord, uh, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done, and, uh, excuse me, and thy thoughts which are to usward, they cannot be reckoned up in order unto thee. If I would declare and speak of them, they are more than can be numbered. Here's what he's saying, that, that I've given you these few, and I'm going to stop there because it's impossible to list them all. That's what he's saying. He says it, it, can't, uh, it cannot be reckoned, and it's more than can be numbered. What he's saying is this is, uh, you know, I could spend years trying to list it all out. Here's what I want to get across tonight. Just because... God isn't blessing you um, the way that you think He should doesn't mean that He's not blessing. It just means that we're looking at blessings wrong. It just means that, that you're looking with physical eyes and not spiritual. Because we want it right now. Now we kind of live by um, that, that old adage of a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. We, we think, I, I want what I can have now, and um, kind of live by the, at least the, the, our actions are kind of, I want what I can have now, and let eternity figure itself out. You know, I'm saved, and I'm, we'll figure that out when we get to it. I'll take the bird right now, rather than lay up treasures in heaven. But whether we see them or not, God is doing wonderful works in your life. And as a Christian, no matter what's going on in my life, no matter what's going on in your life, I can see God's wonderful works in me because nothing can change the wonderful works that He did in me when He heard me, He saved me, and He changed me. As I studied this um, for, this, uh, for this message and studied this passage, here's, here's what I thought. Wouldn't it be great if we tried to do this? Try to count the innumerable. If we try to count, he, he, verse 5, he says that, that they are, are more than can be numbered. If we tried to count the innumerable, the wonderful works that God's done in us, try to, to count all the wonderful works that He's done in our life. You know, maybe when you go to bed, rather than falling asleep counting sheep, count blessings. Um, I'm confident you'll have a whole lot better dreams than sheep jumping over a fence. But on top of that, you'll come out from it saying like David, Many, O Lord, my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. I, just because of, of studying for this, I uh, spent a few days this week, um, and I did it, you know, it's not like I stopped everything so I could sit down and do this, but as I was going about other things and just in my mind, thinking of just one after another of a wonderful work that God's done in me, and God's done this for me, and God's done this for me, starting as far back as I could and working my way forward. And, um, and it, I have to say, it made it so that no matter what was happening, happening um, you can't be real upset. When you've just spent two hours thinking of everything good that God has done for you, and then you have like a 30-second minute of something bad happens, it kind of makes it hard to focus on that 30 seconds of bad. Because the, mind, the thought that keeps going through your mind is, wow, 
how, wonder, or how or many, O oh Lord, my God, are the wonderful works which thou hast done. It'll change, it'll change the, your outlook on what's going on around you. Those, those problems won't seem like such a big deal anymore compared to his wonderful works. Here's, here's the idea, very, very simply. I'll, I'll, I'll close with this thought tonight. Let's take some time to focus on the wonderful works, the many wonderful works that God's done in you. And if we'll do that, suddenly the valleys and the trials and the problems and whatever else comes along doesn't seem so big anymore. Because many, O oh Lord my God, are thy wonderful works which thou hast done. Let's pray.